This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. I was talking to somebody today via one of these, you know, it wasn't Skype, but one of these teleconferencing things, apps. And, uh, um, you know, we were exchanging social pleasantries, and the other person said, well, how have you been doing? And, and, you know, I just said uh, in response, well, considering the world's uh, upside down, I'm doing fine. And and uh, <laughs> that's kind of how, like, I feel. Uh, the world's upside down, but I'm doing fine. Um, and that isn't to negate or to be uh, insensitive to people who are suffering a great deal, either because of physical illness, death in the family, God forbid, who knows what else. Uh, people are suffering, so that's not meant to be uh, insensitive. However, whether you're suffering or not suffering, the key is surviving. The key is to survive, first and foremost. That's mission number one, survive. Mission number two is to uh, overcome, learn how to overcome the spiritual battle. and. Um, uh, mission number three, in the words of Jesus Christ, is to occupy, occupy the land until I come. Okay, so given those three mission statements, uh, many years ago, there was a, it was on for endless um, amounts of years, a, a, a sitcom uh, called MASH. Uh, and in the sitcom, they were uh, in a mash unit, which was, I, I guess, a tented, surgical, portable military mini hospital type thing. Okay, and so all the lead characters were doctors and nurses, etc. But when they would be, I, I remember, I was never never a huge fan of the show. But when I would watch it, there would be a lot of scenes where the doctors would be gathering around a patient in surgery inside this army medical tent or whatever. And uh, they they would exchange these off-the-wall jokes. Um, and the other doctors and nurses would laugh. Now, that that is known as mash humor. And the idea is that the doctors were not being insensitive to to the trauma or the uh, woundedness of the soldier they were operating on, but the intensity of the psychological pressures that they had to deal with in an emergency operating unit in the military that operated in a tent, you know, relatively close to uh, to a battlefield, I guess. Um, you've got to you've got to be at a peak state of consciousness. I'm not talking about mysticism. You've got to be on your game. You know what I'm talking about. You've got to be alert. You've got to be you've got to be capable of doing the job, and you cannot fall apart. So uh, one of the ways that that people have survived intense situations is they develop, it's, it's not a sarcasm, it transcends sarcasm, it's what they call mass humor. You make jokes, you laugh in the middle of a crisis or, um, or a, a traumatic thing, if, if you can, okay, it may not be possible to laugh. The suffering may be so great, I'm not, so I'm not saying go insane. So the point is that by laughing, by what that does is that fires off chemicals in your body and your brain to keep you like up and in in, in a state of competency. So man has learned to do this. Science has learned to do this. People learn to do this just instinctively when they go through trauma or adversity, etc. So we as Christians should do it even more 
it's not being insensitive. Of course, it could be applied in a very insensitive manner. It depends who you're laughing with and making jokes with and, and what time and who's in the room, etc. Um, the thing is, though, that, you know, the Lord tells us the joy of the Lord is our strength. And people have this idea of, of joy that's... Um, well, I don't think people understand joy. It's very complex. There's this like mystical joy, euphoria piece, the joy of the Lord. And most people go to default into that position. That's fine. But I think because we serve the infinite personal living God of the universe, where God, when he defines himself in the book of Genesis, and when God, when he defines himself and reveals himself to mankind, in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we notice that God goes out of his way to depict himself as a supreme being, but not only that, a personal God. This is what fundamentally makes biblical Christianity totally different than any other religion in mankind's history and in, in, in planet Earth. All right? Because the vast majority of, of religions, with the exception of Judaism, they teach kind of in a mystical God and a non-personal God, whereas the whole crux of the biblical truth is in well, it's found in the book of Genesis, Genesis where God says um, he created uh, man, he created them in the image of God, he created them male and female. And so, so Adam and Eve, male and female, were created in the image of God. Well, what was one of the most fundamental characteristics of Adam and Eve? They each had their own autonomous, separate, distinct personality. God has a personality, a distinct personality. You may say, well, I don't know about that. That's because you don't know God. <laughs> it's really simple. If you knew him, you'd know that he is a distinct personality, just like if you could recall certain acquaintances, acquaintances, let's say friends at work, people that you know that are friends, family, I don't know, whatever you want to characterize as a friend, okay, you uh, know that each person that you know has a different personality. And you you can't always use three words to define it, but you understand that people have different personalities and temperaments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're created in the image of God. That is a direct revelation, a direct implication that God has a personality, which also integrates with his the character of God. Okay, so. When we uh, are filled with joy, and joy is, is a manifestation, one of the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit, uh, nothing would be love, peace, joy, uh, long-suffering. So the point is that a personal application of God's joy is the ability to laugh not, necess not necessarily in a sadistic manner, um, uh, but laughter that is, well, laughter that doesn't violate the, the, the highest law, which is to love God and to love your neighbors yourself. So if your laughter, which is so often the case in society at large or in, in environments of society, unfortunately, like the family and the workplace or whatever, despite all this blah blah about zero tolerance, tolerance and stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of the laughter of, of our society is has a vindictive laughing at or mocking at or lowering or, or debasing somebody else. Laughter is based on that. Even even the way the uh, all the major comedians. At night, all the major TV personalities, the majority of them, all attack uh, President uh, Trump uh, for put-down humor. It's done primarily as a political weapon, but they're using humor as a weapon. They want to degrade and topple the president psychologically so that he can be toppled physically. 
It's, it's very simple. But um, apart from that, we could call the sinful application of man's humor. Humor, laughter, personality are all the creation of God. It's all part of the multifaceted uh, uh, nature of God. And so laughter is a, is a gift from God, first and foremost, because laughter and joy go hand in hand. If you're around people who never laugh and, and, and are humorless, I'm telling you right now, they don't have very much joy in their life. A person who doesn't know how to laugh takes themselves too seriously. And what is it when you take yourself too seriously? You're self-centered. Being self-centered, of course, is being carnal. It's of the flesh. It's, it's, it's the embodiment of the flesh. So God, you, God gives us the gift of humor as a, as a tool, as an asset to enable us to overcome. And that's what he wants for us. You see, it doesn't. You see, when you when you study Bible prophecy biblically, and hopefully with some humility, when you study Bible prophecy biblically, you you understand that. Um, because I remember as a professor of uh, eschatology or Bible prophecy with major. Uh, Christian seminary and college, teaching it for decades, Bible prophecy, and uh, I would teach all the basic theories. Some people say it's doctrine. Uh, I, I would not call the timing of the rapture a doctrine. Um, a doctrine is like the Trinity, the triune nature of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, other doctrines are the uh, the doctrine of the church and the, but the virgin birth, the ascension, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, 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 the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, then you can debate under the umbrella of the second coming. Is the second coming consist of a rapture and then another second coming, or is it one event? I mean, you can debate it within that context. Um, but I don't think the Bible teaches the timing of the rapture as a doctrinal statement. Doesn't mean it's not an important theological belief and statement. It is. It's very important. And teaching it correctly is important. Teaching it based on the Word of God is important. But let, but God, you know, after teaching this for decades in a seminary. And, and I try to teach each belief system as fairly as I possibly could. You know, pre-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, uh, and then all the lesser titled timetables for the rapture. The point is, whenever the rapture is, I see, I'm not into debating the time of the rapture. Because there's other people who do that, and they do a very good job. I don't need, to, I, you know, I'm not called to do everybody's ministry, and I could never do my own. The focal point that the Lord has given me is whenever the Lord returns, and to be very honest with you, my one of my spiritual fathers, uh, Jack Hayford, who I was worked closely in his ministry with for over 25 years, longer than that, for crying out loud. And Pastor Jack Hayford would always make a joke when he, when he did preach on on things like the rapture and stuff. He wasn't a big Bible prophecy person, although, in some respects, he was. Um, but he he his joke, which I would liberally borrow and give him credit for, was that the first bu bus that comes, I'm out of here. So whenever the Lord decides to take his church out of this world home to heaven, hey, I'm up for it. That's what he was saying. So if the first bus that comes while we're waiting for the Lord to return, if that happens to be a pre-trib rapture bus, I'm going to hop on it. And so are you if you have any brains. 
if it's not a pre-trib rapture bus, but a mid-trib or a pre-wrath rapture bus, then then I prepared for that. And also, if it's a post-trib um, rapture. So my faith is not in a man's system of eschatology. My faith is in in, in the faithfulness, uh, faithful and true. It will say on Christ when he returns on a white horse at the second coming. That's who my faith is in, God who is faithful. And so when Jesus tells me and every other believer to occupy until I come, that simply means we're to spiritually occupy the land until he comes. So we shouldn't really be all that hung up about when the timing of the rapture is. Because if we're being faithful, we're going to be doing our, our father's business, not just our own business. The key is we are faithful in season and out of season. We're faithful whenever the Lord comes. Our faith shouldn't fall apart. Let's say it's not a pre-trib rapture, just, just for the sake of a hypothetical theological argument. Is your faith going to fall apart because, because the Lord um, didn't rapture you uh, when you thought you'd be raptured? Well, if it's going to fall apart, you, 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 you built your faith on man and the charisma of man and the charisma of certain authors and Bible teachers. You didn't put it on God's Word. There's a lot of times in the Bible where God, God's people think God's doing one thing one way, and he does it a different way. So my job is to be faithful, which means to occupy until he comes. And yes. If you ask me what my preference is, my preference is to be raptured in a pre-trib rapture, obviously. Who wouldn't prefer that? Okay, so that's just a, a side note. But you see, the point is, we're, God has given us the spiritual abilities and, 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 and an amplification of our spiritual abilities. The Lord has given us a spiritual amplification of our abilities so that we can be overcomers in the last days. That's the whole point. So we have been in the last days technically since the church was born in Acts chapter 2 in the upper room, when they received power from on high. You know, the thought <laughs> just occurred to me, and I really didn't, I didn't plan beforehand to say this, but it just came to me a second ago when I said what I said. And that is this. God supernaturally gives his people what they need, the power they need, the anointing they need, the wisdom they need. He gives them, my grace is sufficient for thee. That he gives you what, what you need when you need it. Okay? Now, um, to occupy until he comes to preach the gospel and win souls until he comes, which is what this the primary goal of Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church, is to preach the gospel and win souls and evangelize and then make disciples of all nations, teaching people the word, etc., etc. And God will supernaturally give us the power and the wisdom and the anointing to do that if we're faithful to step out and do what God told us to do. So, the church is born in the book of Acts in fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, when the Spirit is poured out upon all flesh. Now, I know I've read these passages to you, but I would say they are among the most important passages in the Bible, specifically for the church and for Israel in the last days. And you say, why do you say Israel? Because the, the first part of this prophecy is uttered by the, the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. So Joel, let me read you what Joel has to say. Um... Okay, here's Joel, chapter 2. 
And this is a personal thing, okay? So I like to relate to you personally. So I just sometimes tell you stuff, okay? That's off the record. But I tell you publicly. Am I going to do this? Yes, I'm going to do this. I had the privilege of being, Jack Hayward was the executive editor for the Spiritual Life Bible for students. And um, I was, there were like three major contributors besides him, and I was one of them. So I wrote all the notes in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation um, that are called in-text notes. And then I wrote wrote all the word what were called word wealth notes, all the world word wealth notes from Genesis to Revelation, and those were like uh, um, what the Greek word or the uh, uh, Hebrew word the translations mean. But but see in my heart. Um, I, I, Jack Hayford asked me to do this because he believed in my spiritual gifting uh, and my proven faithfulness as a minister over years. So, um, but my he knew my heart would be really reaching out to young people. So I would sneak in these chapters, like here's one now in, in, in one of the notes in the book of Joel. It says in big letters, Apocalypse Now. Now, I did that on purpose, knowing full well that the editors, <laughs> they wouldn't know, or if they did know, they wouldn't know. It was obviously a coded reference to the Francis Ford Coppola movie, Apocalypse Now. Okay? I wasn't undermining the Bible. I was trying to make the title of uh, Joel talking about a future apocalypse. I was trying to make it dynamic and uh, uh, exciting and appealing and inviting to young people, younger adults, non-religious people. I was trying to like turn, it, God's word doesn't need to be turned on, but I was using my imagination. Now, did I go and tell the editor what I was doing? No, of course not. <laughs> Jack Hayford had perfect confidence in me. He didn't even question it. I wasn't doing anything he would never agree with himself. And and this version of the Bible sold extremely well. Then they got, well, I won't get, get into that. So next to my notes of Apocalypse Now. And then, oh, I guess I did the notes in the, well, here's another one, the Day of the Locust. That's a, 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 an explanation of, of the verses in Joel there. And that comes from a movie title. The Power of Repentance. This is another one that I did. And it's, see, I wanted to make it exciting and dynamic, not dull religion. Okay, so the point is this. Uh, in Joel chapter 2, and one of my favorite passages in the Bible, Joel chapter 2, um, starting at verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. Now, this is being prophesied by Joel in the Old Testament. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the mountain, the, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like whom has never been seen, nor will there be any such after them, even for many successive generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their, their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run, with noise like chariots, over the mountaintops they leap, like the noise of flaming fire that devours the stubble. Let, let a strong people set in battle array, before the people writhe in pain, and all faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. 
They climb the wall like men of war. Okay, so you get the picture here. Let's go down to verse 11. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their darkness. The Lord gives a voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his work. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Okay. And then um, it tells God's people to repent. Now, therefore, says the Lord, verse 12, Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. He, who knows if he relents from doing harm? Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? A grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. You know, that's a very interesting challenge that the prophet Joel is making. We're, the Lord is clearly revealing in his word and through the prophet Joel that this day of the Lord is going to be awful, horrific. And it, it, it's saying, you know, all, all, the earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble. I mean, this is, this, is like, this is like doomsday. The day of the Lord is very, is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Okay. Who can endure the day of the Lord? Verse 12. Now, therefore, says the Lord, so, so God is calling on his people to repent. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent? and leave a blessing behind them, and a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? You see, there's something interesting going on here. This is not a, a, a fatalistic pronunciation from the Lord. In the middle of this countdown to the day of the Lord, it says stuff like, turn to me in repentance and fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. So God is calling his people and sinners to repent right when the day of the Lord, you know, doomsday, is about to detonate, okay? God is, is through the Holy Spirit, through the prophet Joel, calling his people to repent and, and specifically saying, for he is gracious and merciful, Slow to anger and great kindness. God is not drooling to detonate the day of the Lord. And then it says, and he relents from doing harm. Relents means like he changes his mind. He stops from doing harm. He stops from the judgment. What's going to... So right here, we're in a countdown, literally Armageddon here, a countdown to the apocalypse here. And... Under the anointing, the prophet Joel is saying stuff. If we listen to what God is saying through the prophet Joel, who knows if he will turn? Turn from what? This judgment is he's unleashing. And relent. And then you'd be surprised. Leave a blessing behind him. So in other words, it can look like, what this is saying is it can look like this is doomsday, about ready to detonate. But who knows what God will do if his people will repent and fast and pray and weep. And then, it, that, then, there's, then God floats this out and leave a blessing behind him. So they're, they're thinking it's, it's like the detonation of doomsday, but God could turn um, his intention here and bless them supernaturally, unexpectedly. Verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion. 
Okay, so what happens here? When we move from 14 to 15 in Acts chapter 2, there's a transition. It, it, before we go to the transition, God says this, and who knows if he will turn and relent? So there's a question mark raised here. Is God going to do what he just said he was going to do? Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? Okay. Blow the trumpet in Zion. So this is this is a call to the watchman. That's that's what I am, the Paul McGuire Ministries. We are a watchman on the wall ministry. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. This is what God's people should be doing right now at this minute, all over America, all over the world, as we are in a global crisis of whatever the origins are. You know, it's one of these things. I have my opinions on it. I've written books about it, biological warfare, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever the origins of this uh, pandemic are, they're demonic in, in their destructiveness. And this, this call uh, to God's people to repent, to fast, okay, <clears throat> is for you and I now. Hello? This is our, we're supposed to not look at, you don't go to the Drudge Report or, or the CDC website and look at the projections of the coronavirus and the deaths and stuff. You don't ignore them. You're aware of it, but you're aware of the other polls too. You're aware, you're aware of the fact that there's contradictory perceptions as to what's going to happen. You don't walk around clueless. But God is the one who has the final say so. And here, if God is saying, if my people are going to really seriously repent, um, gather the children and the nursing babes, call a sacred assembly, blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, assemble the elders, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber. I believe that's speaking of Jesus. So while they're blowing a trumpet in Zion, consecrating a fast, the bridegroom is going out from his chamber. Ooh, that's serious, man. That's serious. The bridegroom is Jesus. So it's like literally apocalypse now, the day of the Lord, countdown to Armageddon. Who can endure it? I mean, the world will never see anything like what's about to come down on it. All right. That's what it says in Joel. And then there's this interruption of that flow of wrath and judgment. And, and God is saying, what if his people turn to him with fasting, weeping, mourning of heart, rending your heart, not your garments? And what if God changes his mind and blesses his people instead? Why don't you hear this being preached? Because people like to, to cherry pick the parts of the verses that they like and ignore the qualifying verses, the explanatory verses, the verses that define the other verses. Call a sacred assembly. And so while this, this God is not saying what is happening here, which is very interesting. He's leaving it open-ended, but he's offering tremendous hope. So the fact that this is happening now, and then... While all this is happening, this appeal is being made. The watchmen are blowing the trumpet like I'm doing now and others are doing now. And at the same time, this is the most mind-blowing part. The bridegroom is starting to go out from his chamber. Whoa. The bridegroom is Jesus. His chamber is the throne room of God. He's going out of his chamber. Okay? To do what? What to do what all bridegrooms do in a marriage ceremony. They're going to get their bride. Whoa. Wow. I mean, is it clicking for you? It should be clicking for you. It, it, this is awesome. This is monumental. This is beyond, this is, this is staggering beyond belief. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber. Wow. 
and the bride from her dress room, dressing room. The bridegroom, again, is Jesus. The bridegroom is the supernatural body of Christ, you and I. The, the bridegroom is leaving his chamber, and, and the bride from her dressing room. Okay, now you don't have to be a, 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 a Nazi rocket scientist <laughs> to figure this out. For some irony, I have three. This wasn't. This is the weirdest thing. It's just totally. Well, it's it's just ironical. I have three friends and very good. No, I have three friends who are all rocket scientists. But now I'll leave it at that. Isn't that a word? Then I won't go into it. Okay. But I added the word Nazi to it. I'm not, I'm not implying that today's rocket scientists are Nazis. That's not what my point was. I was going back to uh, Operation Paperclip when the U.S. government brought in 10,000 Nazi rocket scientists and biological warfare scientists at the end of World War II in 1948 during a secret operation called Operation Paperclip. Okay, so now, now let's just like zero in on this. Let the bridegroom come out from his chamber. So Jesus is starting to rise, and the bride from her dressing room. We all kind of have an idea of what the bride looks like in her dressing room. I remember visiting my wife in the dressing room with the bride. I don't know if I was supposed to be there, but I visited. And this is usually when the bride is often the most lovely, right before her face is glowing and stuff during the marriage ceremony that comes seconds or minutes after she starts to leave. You see how close we are? I mean, just picture this in earthly terms of a wedding ceremony, and the bridegroom is starting to come out of his chamber. The, the bride is coming out of her chamber. Wow, that means there's people ready to join in on the marriage ceremony. But here, let's remember, the bridegroom is Jesus, and the bride is the body of Christ. And let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Now, why would they be weeping? If this was simply a normal situation, come on, track with me now. Why would they be weeping? If we're in the middle of a marriage ceremony, people do weep with, people weep with like emotions of joy and gladness. Oftentimes the mother or, or whatever will be weeping. The father will be. It's a very emotional moment for the families, their little boy or girl that they've raised or whatever to be the bride or the bridegroom. This is a, one of these life-shaping moments. So that's why they're crying. But here, God's introducing a weeping of repentance. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber, and the bride from her dressing room. Now, once we understand that's the body of Christ and Jesus Christ, this is, becomes a very heavy territory. And then it says, weep between the porch and the altar. The, the weeping between the porch and the altar, this is not about mothers crying with joy that they're their daughter is getting married, okay? No, 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 no. This is now, God has, has flipped the switch and introduced a electrifying message of the need for his own people to seriously repent uh, at this exact moment. Do you see what's happening prophetically? You don't, I don't need to be taken up in the astral plane and have some vision, okay? There's plenty of visions in the Bible. Okay? Plenty. So let's start covering some of the biblical visions. Okay, so let them say, Spare your people, O Lord. Now, why, why would you be crying out, Spare my people, O Lord, in the middle of, of, a, of a wedding that's about to happen between the bride and the bridegroom? The bridegroom being the body of Christ and the the bride, excuse me, the bridegroom being Jesus and the bride being the body of Christ. And it says, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. So there's weeping going on here. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Why would you be saying an intercessory prayer in repentance, spare your people, O Lord, if it's, this is a wedding ceremony? 
man, this is there's so much prophecy in there for you to understand that this is electrifying. It's like a, an electric bolt came out of heaven and it has ignited the page of the Word of God. This should be this could this should be exploding in your inner man and woman, and with the explosion of power from on high being transmitted from his word, your inner man and woman should be so nourished now, it should be like you've been filled with the hope and the glory of of the return of the Lord. This is so powerful. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach. So there's a crying out from the prophet Joel, don't give your people. Now here, he's talking about the Jews. He has a covenant with the Jews. This is talking about a future time when the bridegroom, which is Jesus, is meeting the bride. So it's going back and forth, back and forth. God's allowed to do that. He can write his word any way he wants to write it. That the nation should rule over them. So so this is an understanding that God has made a covenant with the the children of Israel. It's an everlasting covenant to protect them, to be their people, to be their Messiah, okay? That is not over yet. And one of the appeals is the apostle, uh, not the apostle, the, the prophet Joel is reminding the Lord that, hey, you've got a covenant with us. The whole world will, they'll be reproach, disgust will come upon the pagan peoples, as they look at Israel, if if their God, if Israel's God deserts them, that they should say among the peoples, where is their God, in a mocking tone. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you approach among the nations. Okay, so starting at verse 18, there's a supernatural deliverance occurring within the context of both what we would call church-related, the supernatural body of Christ, church-related events, and God's people, Israel-related events. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land. When it says the Lord will be zealous for his land, and this was spoken of by the prophet Joel, it's speaking specifically of not some mystical land. It's talking about the land of Israel. That's the land of promise. So we know that God is specifically at this, with this verse, is not talking to the Christians. He's talking to the Jews. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I I will send you grain and new wine and oil and you will be satisfied by them. So, so God, God is pointing to the climax of an age-long promise of redemption here. That's what is happening. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Remember, the Jews, when they were driven from their land after Jesus ascended, and the Roman general Titus invaded Israel, the Jews were driven from their land to the four corners of the earth for over 2,000 years of captivity, slavery, and reproach, culminating in the uh, Adolf Hitler's uh, Holocaust nightmare. Okay? So you will no longer be a reproach among the nations. Verse 20, but I will remove... See, this is sliding and integrating right into Bible prophecy. But I will remove far from you the northern army. Where's the northern army? Who is the Northern Army? Well, it's very possible the Northern Army is Russia. Rosh, because it's to the uttermost north of Israel. And drive him away into a barren and desolate land, with his face toward the eastern sea and his back towards the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise, because he has done monstrous things. Now. What I'm going to do now is I'm not giving you, I'm not not trying to claim, thus saith the Lord. Okay, what I'm trying to say is this could be a possibility to understanding this verse. When it talks about the northern army, that could be Russia, 
But then when it talks about this stench will come up, its foul odor will rise uh, because he has done monstrous things. It, it seems to be this, this giant demonic-like sea creature that's being spoken of. So it could be that this is talking about a principality in power, a demonic principality in power. Fear not, O land, again, Israel. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. For the open pastures are springing up, and the trees are bearing fruit. So this is a glimpse here, I think, right here, of, of the 1,000-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So, um, in my note here, that I wrote. It's called A Rainstorm of Glory. And th these are the notes that I included in this Bible, which you can read in, in the Bible itself. It's printed in the Bible. The latter rain is the spring rain that occurs just before harvest. The outpouring of refreshing rain, which renews the fertility of the parched ground, is like the Holy Spirit, which is poured out in great showers of blessing before the great harvest of souls and global evangelism. We live in a time when the Spirit of God is about to be poured out again in a great gushing Pentecost of the Holy Spirit revival. It is going to sweep the earth with the mighty flood tides of His glory. And although there is an all-out escalation of the powers of darkness, the Lord has promised that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. See, I believe that's what, I wrote this, when did I write this? I didn't write the Bible, I wrote this interpretation. What's the copyright for this Bible? 1995. So, it's the copyright. And, people, a difference I've always had it's not a major difference, it's a peripheral difference between some Bible prophecy teachers and myself, is that I believe all the warnings in the Old Testament and the New Testament about false prophets, false teachers, false Christs, false doctrines, doctrines of demons, deception, the great apostasy, in the last days. So we need to be on our guard against false revival, counterfeit revival, okay? At the same time, just because there's the false and their demonic counterfeits does not preclude the fact that God says in numerous places in the Bible these are going to pour out of spirit in the last days. Because of the pouring out of the spirit obviously has to precede effective, fruitful evangelism. Notice that the early church, what enabled them, the disciples in the early church, to, to transition from like former fishermen and tax collectors, just ordinary men, what, what caused them to, to like, get a jet pack on their, a uh, rocket on their back and turn the entire Roman Empire upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ was the fact that they first received power from on high when they met in the upper room and were seeking the Lord together in prayer. The being it was only after they received power from on high. It was only after that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. As a consequence of the Holy Spirit being poured upon them, they were anointed to be evangelizing, performing miracles, and, and reaching people for Christ and ministering people to Christ. If you're empty and are not filled with the power of God, you are not going to have the supernatural enablement and ability to mission accomplished. It's simple, okay? But it's like, it's, it's this simple. Let me explain how simple it is. Has this ever happened to you? It's happened to me. You have a busy week. You make a mental note as you're driving home from meetings or whatever that you, 
Well, no, you make a mental note in the morning that you got to make sure you stop at the gas station in the evening on your way home to make sure because you're almost out of gas. You got one trip left to get to where you're going in the morning and they come back. But then that evening, you got to fill up your car with gas or you're going to be out of gas. Now, how many have made this mistake? You forget to fill up your car and then you park your car and it's so low on gas. This doesn't usually happen to me because I plan for it, but it's so low on gas that, that you run out of gas because you pressed it. You were late for another meeting. Well, the point is, we all know, that it doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, V8, V4, some monster Ford truck with some monster cab, uh, whether you drive uh, so many of the... Uh, the uh, Jeep type cars and the uh, some of the SUV sport car sports editions. When I say sport edition, I'm talking about the full blown SUVs that are huge. Okay, many of these cars, even though they're for uh, ordinary people, are built to look like military assault vehicles, <laughs> and the paint job is the color of a military assault vehicle. So the consumer SUV has been weaponized for the uh, modern housewife with her cell phone and her tank, literally. Sorry, sarcastic joke. I apologize. And men drive assault vehicles too. Okay, so um, bad joke. I repent. Forgive me. I'm human. All right, so uh, so in Joel, we, we, we will, can't see revival in America until we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We can't see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit until there's repentance. So first there has to be a coming to God and repentance. Then God pours out his Holy Spirit. Then revival and a third great awakening biblically, and a biblical revival can occur. See how simple the equation is? if you do what you're supposed to do. Okay. The nations do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. I was talking about Israel. Why should should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Talking about Israel. Okay. Then the land um the former reign, the latter reign. Now, when it says right after that, the threshing floor, so it talks about, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Then in verse 24, it says, the threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. So let's track with what God is saying through the prophet Joel. He's saying that there's going to be a rain. Okay, this would signify, yes, there's going to be an actual rain on the crops, but more specifically, there's going to be the rain on the Holy Spirit on his people, okay, and this latter rain, and then the the former rain before it, is an outpouring of the Spirit of God, and this outpouring of the Spirit of God upon his people, the result of that, first you have the outpouring of the Spirit, and then the threshing floors shall be full of wheat. That's the good harvest of souls. The threshing floors will be uh, full of wheat. Okay, wheat is the is the produce that represents living souls. And the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. New wine, and the Old Testament refers to the whole well, to, to to the new wine, and it also can refer to the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, in the notes that I wrote called A Rainstorm of Glory, well, let me just read what I wrote again, because it explains this, these verses from Acts, no, excuse me, from Joel 2, 23. The latter rain is the spring rain that occurs just before the harvest. This outpouring of the refreshing refreshing rain, which renews the fertility of the parched ground, is like the Holy Spirit, which is poured out 
in great showers of blessing before the great harvest of souls in global evangelism. We live in a time when the Spirit of God is about to be poured out again in a great gushing Pentecost of of Holy Spirit revival. It is going to sweep the earth with the mighty flood tides of his glory. You know, I'm just reading this, and and this is one of the word explanations I had to write. But like I said before, Jack Hayford was the executive editor. And one thing you know when you when you do when you're a writer, okay, you can you recognize your signature in writing, your your personal style. And you also recognize other people's personal styles if you're familiar with their work. So when I read this line which says, We live in a time when the Spirit of God is about to be poured out again, these words here, in a great gushing Pentecost of Holy Spirit revival. I can tell you, and I'm laughing now uh, with joyous laughter, that even though I wrote that that paragraph, there's a minor change. But I can tell you from reading this exactly, it wasn't some editor at the publisher that changed that line. I can tell you with everything in me, this line here specifically, who knows how many other lines. when the Spirit of God is about to be poured out again in, quote, this, listen carefully, in a great gushing Pentecost revival. Okay, right there. <laughs> that is my dear spiritual father in the Lord. I can, I bet anything those are, that he crossed out whatever I wrote. But this term here, great gushing Pentecost of, of Holy Spirit revival. Let's just, let's just Jack Hayford to the T. See, that's that's not those are not my words. That's not my signature. It's his signature, and so I rejoice with that because that's his his giftingness through him. See, the Lord works through our individual personalities. And then this is my language. You may not be as happy with it compared to Jack Hayford's. It is going to sweep the earth with mighty flood tides of His glory. Although there is an all-out escalation of the powers of darkness, that's definitely my words. The Lord has promised that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against them. See, when you're a writer, I can tell what I wrote. Even what when I wrote is is explaining the Word of God. I can tell it by my signature, and I recognize other people's signatures. Those that you write know what I'm talking about. Musicians, it's like that. If I occasionally I watch some of these, you know, these audition television shows like American Idol, and what's the other one? forgot what the other one is. But you'll have a female artist who's auditioning in these American Idol-type programs, but The Voice, and female and male, and they'll, they'll be doing another artist's song. Sometimes that artist is sitting there judging them. And there's always a stylistic difference between somebody trying to sing somebody else's song. And musicians and songwriters are very aware of their signature. Well, writers are too. That's the the, the, the point. Um, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust is eaten. Now, now this gets even more intense because this can be applied to you when you come to the Lord and are, uh, repent and ask the Lord to fill you with His Holy Spirit. This promise you could claim personally. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. So that's something you could claim as an individual person or for your family through repentance and intercessory prayer. But it's also applicable to the children of Israel. Okay, when they were when they were taken into captivity, when they were uh invaded by foreign armies, God prom- promises to redeem them and to bring them back as his. And and God sums it up whether it's for personal application or for the nation of Israel who God has d- dealt wondrously with you. And I want to I want to just challenge you. If you do not have the mindset and the frame of mind in your heart 
if your heart cannot contain the fullness or your mind cannot contain the fullness of the reality that the God of the Bible is a God who who delights in dealing wondrously with you, then you don't know the God of the Bible. Of how many people, of how many systems, of how many individuals or groups of individuals can you truly say that their greatest joy is to deal with you or to relate to you wondrously? Practically nobody. You know what I'm talking about. Practically nobody. But think about this. God is love. And it is the delight of God. I really pray in the name of Jesus that the power of the Holy Spirit would would unveil this burning truth of freedom to those that need to hear it right now in Jesus' name, and that the blindness that comes from a religious pharisaical spirit would be broken right now in the name of Jesus. God who has dealt wondrously with you. We could spend four hours easily teaching on what kind of God is it whose greatest delight is to deal wondrously with you? How, when you think of those that rule above you, are you thinking of people who their greatest delight is to deal wondrously with you? No, that's, that's like almost non-existent in our society. But that's what God wants for you. And my, never, and my people shall never be put to shame. That's for you right now in this lifetime and for the children of Israel. If your life has, shame has been put on your life, if you've been shamed when you return to the Lord to be filled with the Holy Spirit, God will remove the shame that the devil put on you. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, making it very clear that the primary application of, this, of these promises and prophecies is the nation of Israel. Although I believe on a secondary, on a secondary level, they can be applied by believers in, in specific instances. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Okay. This, in Joel chapter 2, is exactly what Peter quotes in uh, Acts chapter 2. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream, dr- vis- shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my maidservants and on my men servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. That's today. It's the last days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars, of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. We see that. The moon into blood. We see that before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be soft, saved. Wow. 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 This is so mind blowing. How can you not be excited by the word of God? I'm going to continue, and I want to explain this to you. It's really easy to understand. So the the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. Jesus, at the second coming, is going to deliver his people Israel. Okay? And the Lord has said among the remnant who he's, the Lord calls. For behold, in those days and at that time, I, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So God is going to put a supernatural hook in the jaw and bring all the nations that have rebelled against Christ to Armageddon. Okay, where he's going to enter into judgment with him there. And I will enter into judgment with him there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot and sold a girl 
for wine that they may drink. Okay, I just want to land here for a second because the Spirit of the Lord just brought something to my attention, and I've read this. I've read this many times, and I've processed it, but it's like the Lord is like electrifying the verses. When God is judging the nations in Armageddon, you say, how could a good God do that? Well, here, here's a clue. What, what is causing God to judge the nations in Armageddon is that the pagan people, the pagan nations of the world have divided up the land of Israel. They have cast lots for my people. They sold them as slaves, the pagan nations. But listen carefully. Among the critical highest priority sins, which God is listing here through the prophet Joel, as one of the main reasons why God is going to judge the nations with his wrath at the Battle of Armageddon. Look what it says. One of the, re- the main reasons why. The people of the earth, the people of all these nations, or, or, or alliances of nations, that who have rejected Christ among their sins, look what the sin is. They have given a boy as payment for a harlot, which simply means they sold a little boy like you would sell a harlot, which simply means they sold a little boy for somebody's sexual abusive pleasure. That's called pedophilia. And then, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. So, so a young little girl, pedophilia, you sell her body for, for the cost of a glass of wine. This is talking about sex tra- human sex trafficking. And it's never been more clear to me than it is now. And it's human sex trafficking of the innocent little boy and little girl that is among the highest level priority of sins before God. It says, it says it right here. You'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to miss it. And this is why God's coming back at the second coming with Armageddon. Okay, so let me read you the notes I wrote. I called them On the Road to Armageddon in this Bible, the Spirit-Filled Life Bill Bible for Students. Joel, you know, there's, another, there's a couple of versions. The, 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 this is the, these are the versions. These Bibles are big, like regular Bibles. There's other versions that came afterwards, to be quite honest, where they mutilated the the, the contents of the... They just, in my humble opinion, didn't deliver. Okay, I'll leave it at that. So you're going to make sure you get the right edition. My name is in in the edition with the notes that I wrote. It's listed among the contributors. You'll see Word, Wealth, and In-Text Notes, Paul McGuire. Author, speaker, Bible teacher, Paul McGuire Ministries. Okay, that, if it, that's the version you're getting. Theoretically, they didn't change the notes because it was a bestseller, and they did several editions. But I picked up a later edition. I don't want to confuse you. Where they they got rid of what I would consider the, the high powered. And this is not like an egocentric defense of what was done. It was. This was done, what motivated me was a burning, fiery passion to reach young people and to reach people who were turned off by Christian religion and the Bible. So when I poured my heart out on this, I tried to use words like Earth's final battle, on the road to Armageddon, stuff that's exciting, not stuff that's boring and religious and filled with unbelief. So let me read what I wrote to you in this Bible. Joel described a time in human mankind's future when those of Judah and Israel who are now living throughout all the nations of the earth or scattered throughout all the nations will return to Israel. Many Bible scholars, particularly those dispensational of dispensa- dispensational persuasion, believe that this speaks of the dispersed Jews returning to a restored end times Israel. Others see it symbolically applying to the church. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? Okay, so let's let's uh, continue down. Um,
verse 12, let the nations be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit, or the valley of Megiddo, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Who are the surrounding nations? All the nations of the earth come down to the valley of Megiddo to fight Armageddon and to attack Jesus Christ and the armies of heaven. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go, come, go down, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Now, I don't believe, when it says that the Lord will roar from Zion, it means exactly that. And utter his voice from Jerusalem at the second coming. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of his children Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no aliens shall pass through her again. So we'll continue on with this, but this is also what is quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2, when the, when the, the Lord pours out the Holy Spirit on the church. It was a fulfillment of the prophecy in uh, Joel 2. Acts 2 is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, clearly, um, we have never lived in a time period before where there has never been more open hearts, more people hungry, literally starving for spiritual truth and spiritual answers. And this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries, Paradise Mountain Church, is, is reaching those people with the gospel. And we're poised to expand, to reach even more people with the gospel by teaching them Bible prophecy, by making disciples of all nations, and by Christian apologetics, and by applying the truth of the Word of God in terms of a biblical worldview, and analyzing for people as a method of evangelism current and contemporary events. That's what this is all about along with Paradise Mountain Church and our regular meetings at Paradise Mountain Church, which for temporarily we've had to suspend because of the, the coronavirus implications. And, um, you know, that has to continue until it's safe for people to, 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 to meet again. Our teaching is available for you. Just go to paulmcguire.us, go to the Roku channel, and you'll see at least a thousand hours of Bible teaching, prophetic Bible teaching I've given at the um, Paradise Mountain Church meetings, at conferences. So we have tons of free videos on the Roku channel. You get to the Roku, Roku channel by going to paulmcguire.us. We have the Paul McGuire Radio Report. It's about two hours a day or so. Uh, Monday through Friday. It's on all kinds of social media platforms for both audio and video. And I want to emphasize to you, it is absolutely essential. It's more essential now than I, when I first talked about it, which began several years ago, that when you watch or hear or see a message that you believe needs to be spread, that you actively take it upon yourself to spread the links of every message you believe is going to help other people. Because there is a massive computerized system of censoring, erasing, and blocking <clears throat> all kinds of content with Christian or conservative truth. There's a war against it by the big tech companies. So you, you if you click in a search engine, you will no longer, you haven't been this hasn't been operational for years. You will no longer go to any site that proclaims truth, biblical truth, Bible prophecy truth, truth on health or whatever. You're going to, those people are all censored. And only the fake news media is allowed open or the 
which many people haven't gotten sophisticated enough to realize there are literally thousands and thousands of counterfeit websites with counterfeit hosts who have been raised up as agents of disinformation. And they, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> they're, they're out there, believe me, by the thousands. Most of them are computer generated. Some have budgets. But you see, it's really amazing to me because I can, I can turn to somebody who claims to be talking about Bible prophecy and the Bible and current events and stuff. And, and you know, in a matter of five minutes or whatever, the Holy Spirit in you tells you whether or not people are truly born again or they're just faking it. They just learned the language. And you should be able to look into the eyes of somebody. And you just, does it, you're not judging them there on, on, your, on their appearance. It's, it's the spirit in them. Have they been born again? And whenever I look at somebody who's pretending to be born again and pretending to be given a prophetic message, but has really been raised up by the dark side, if you will, it's amazing to me how many believers have, have not walked with the Lord in an in, in, in intimate way, so they, can't, they cannot look and detect between a spiritual counterfeit and the real thing. And that's because they have, have not spent enough time in a relationship with the real thing, with, which is Jesus Christ. You see, people who are familiar with dollar bills and $100 bills, they can spot a counterfeit $100 bill very quickly because they're familiar with the original. Christians who are not familiar with Jesus Christ on a personal level can't see the counterfeit, and there are thousands. And I'll give you, no, I won't give you the clues, but there's some really obvious clues. And if, but if I give out the clues, then I won't, can't. I'd love to, believe me, but I can't. It would be counterproductive in the long, long term. Got to learn now to tell the difference between somebody who's genuine and somebody who's phony. I mean, that's, that's biblical Christianity 101. Really? Okay, so the key is no longer will the uh, search engines and stuff funnel people looking for answers would normally be funneled to Christian organizations, Christians, people with biblical truth, prophetic truth, etc., etc. No, they're now redirected to the twilight zone, or the search engines will will only. What what really happens is the search engines almost bring up complete fake news sites or fake sites, okay, or politically correct sites. That's what's going on. It's an all-out war. If you're oblivious to it, it's shame on you, really. If you're oblivious to what I'm talking about, shame on you. You should know better. If you are so disconnected from Jesus that you can't tell the counterfeit from the real, then shame on you. You need to spend more time with the real. But unless you send out the links of programs like this and videos that you believe in and radio programs and messages and whatever social media you want to use, unless you do the spreading, which is a couple of clicks on your keyboard, etc., or your cell phone, um, they won't get spread because it's a rigged system. The Internet is rigged to war against, to censor, to remove, to erase, to make disappear all dissenting voices to the globalist, to the occult globalist one world system. That's, that's concise. So you've got to spread it. If you don't spread it, it goes nowhere. See, that didn't used to be the case. In 2016, at the very early part of 2016, that was not the case. In 2016, the new era of the internet began, which is total George Orwell thought police, just like in China. So if you, if you want to partner in winning souls, you need to help those ministries, those spokespeople that are speaking the truth. Unless you spread their messages, not just mine, their messages far and wide, they're going nowhere. So one of the first things I ask people is, first, I need people to, in order for this ministry to accomplish goals that the Lord has given us, especially winning souls in the last days, 
We have to have people who take it upon their own hearts, a burden of the Holy Spirit. We have to have people who are going to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'd like to be a prayer warrior for Paul McGuire, his family, and Paradise Mountain Church Ministries, and then begin to intercede, read books in intercession. It's not that hard. Uh, intercession is just praying for other people besides yourself. And some of you are gifted, and you will grow. And You can't be really a minister unless you are an intercessor. And guess what? You want to be an intercessor? intercessor? Being an intercessor comes from pain and trial. If you've been in pain and trials and struggles, I already know you're an intercessor, because that's how you survive. So I want to thank each and every one of you out there who, who have genuinely yielded and, and are obeying the Lord, and you have chosen to be intercessors for me, this ministry, and my family. I thank God for you, and together we're winning the spiritual war. I want to thank God for every one of you who send the links of these messages, these programs, these videos, far and wide. Send them to groups and everything else that would be receptive. Because be aware, if you don't send them, there's a, an invisible wall built to keep truth from going into the general public. Whether it's political truth, whether it's scientific truth or biblical truth, so thank God for those of you that send these messages far and wide. And finally, we are poised to grow, to reach more people with a biblical worldview, more people with a prophetic biblical message and with answers, and really win them to Christ or really cause them to repent of their backsliding. And we have people who contact us every week who's all over the world whose lives have been changed by this ministry. Um, and we're able to do that because many of you went to the Lord. I didn't have to manipulate you. I don't believe in manipulation. I just simply say, go to the Lord, ask the Lord how much you should give financially or with your donations or contributions. And then whatever God tells you to do, obey Him. Okay? And that's between you and Him, whether you give faithfully a, a small amount every month, well, that all adds up to, to a big amount. Or you're faithful to give a large amount or faithful to give an outrageously large amount. It's all on, it's all on how much has God blessed you? How much, uh, and what is God telling you to do with your funds? And then whatever he tells you to do, do that. Okay? And as a blessing, you know, you should give where you're fed, where the Lord's moving, where the Holy Spirit is building you up. That's your spiritual uh, storehouse. That's your church where you're being fed, where you're being built up in the Holy Spirit. And that should continue, by the way, whether you're in physical proximity proximity or not. We haven't stopped reaching people at all. In fact, we've increased reaching people because we don't have to have a physical location. We meet regularly at a physical location, but that's not, especially in California, that's not prudent right now. So we're, we're being wise. So thank God for all of you who have obeyed the Lord's call to be a partner with me and our ministry. And I, as often as I can, I try to read your letters, your emails, pray for you when you make the request. Um, and I thank God for you. May the Lord bless you. May he anoint you. And I want to encourage you to draw close to him like uh, Israel and God's people were commanded in, in the verses that I shared with you so that the Lord can pour out his spirit on you. And with the outpouring of the spirit, the Lord pours out a spiritual harvest, but the Lord knows that that requires a level of wealth, a level of prosperity, a level of blessing, okay? And so don't be embarrassed about asking the Lord for, for blessing if your heart's right. I mean, if you're asking for your third, you know, $5 million yacht, that's probably indulgent. But, but 
the Lord knows you have needs. My God shall supply all of your need. When it says need, it means needs. My God shall supply all of your need. That, that word need is not in the singular. Need means all of your need combined into one need. God, you, you, our God will supply all of your needs or need in Christ Jesus when you use the keys of the kingdom. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Make sure you sign up for and, and you know, sign up friends that want to be part of our various social media. But it's important that you you sign up for it or that you interact with it. Um, the the brighteon.com channel, the Roku channel, the Vimeo, the uh, the um, YouTube, and Facebooks, and we have so many other platforms for this radio program. Connect to them. Spread them far and wide. We need your help. We really do. We need your help. We have to reach this nation. And right now, it's, it's critical that we reach this nation. Because behind the scenes, we're dealing with a stronghold, a principality in power. In fact, I, I, I'm going to get into that in the next programs. Behind the coronavirus is a spiritual war, okay? The Apostle Paul taught us that. So there's a spiritual war behind the coronavirus. Who, where did the coronavirus originate from? You hear people say, oh, it was not a biological warfare weapon. I don't know whether it was or not, but... In my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, I talk about biological warfare, how, vi how 5G amplifies people who have autoimmune diseases, how 5G triggers diseases. The Lord, that was all through the Holy Spirit, because the Lord, because there was no coronavirus released when. Uh, my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, came out like two months before the coronavirus came out. And I felt the Lord leading me to write on autoimmune diseases, biological warfare, and 5G. And I remember making critical decisions where I chose to leave out a number of things that I knew. It's still here, but I, I nuanced it. I, I left it out because even though I was aware of the research, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to deliberately talk about it right now, but even though as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, um, I haven't personally decided whether the, the sources are accurate. I'm leaning that they will be, that they are accurate. But I didn't put it in the book because if I did, at that time people would have freaked out. They couldn't handle it. They would have thought I was stark raving mad. You'll discover that many of the things that I wrote in The Greatest Battle, as well as in my book before that, which is Conquering the Matrix, and the book before that, which is Mass Awakening, The Day the Dollar Guide, and The Prophecy of Future of America, Volume 1 and Volume 2. You'll find out that the projections or predictions I made, which are based on scientific historical research as well as prayer, not just, not just hallucinogenic fantasies, okay, have a very high probability of. Uh, um, a very high probability of accuracy. And uh, I go where people don't like to go with the, the, the autoimmune diseases and Alzheimer and, and dementia and autism and ADD and ADHD and Asperger's syndrome and the Gulf War disease or Lyme disease and mycoplasma infections, and the role of 5G in aggravating and triggering disease. 
okay? And how your particular electromagnetic frequency is as unique to you as your thumbprint or fingerprint. Now, I'm telling you, when I was finishing up this book with my darling wife, Christina, helping me, remember, <laughs> without her help, the book wouldn't have come out. Why? Because I had 4,000 pages written, and obviously <laughs> nobody is going to read a 4,000-page book. So I got it down to 374 pages. But at the last minute, I was trying to put stuff in, which I, I have printed out. I just didn't put it in this book. I think I'll put it in, in, a, in a booklet or a book compendent to go with this, because it's, 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 it's more than up to date. It'll answer all your questions about what's happening right now. And you need to know about this. Driving, it's been my habit to observe cell phone towers for the last five, six, seven years. So I always notice the amount, the external design. And then I re remember, up until relatively recently, I'm saying, hmm, I don't see a whole lot of 5G antennas. Because if you learn how to tell the difference, you can see a visual, uh, a visual, there's a visual difference between 5G cell towers and, and just regular cell towers or, or, to or regular communications towers. 5G cell towers are have a particular design. There's more of the boxes. There's different sizes of the boxes. The boxes are smaller. The boxes look a little bit more intimidating. It looks more mean. Uh, it's got far more uh, sizes and shapes into it. That's kind of a lousy way to describe it, but you can tell the difference between because it looks like an upgrade over the. Simply put it, it, it has, it's stylistically more impressive. And they are going up all over the place now. Because if you notice carefully, a lot of the cell companies, they have to be careful with their legal language with selling 5G, because the reality is, is that 5G is not fully rolled out yet. Okay, Even if your cell phone says you're receiving 5G or the cell phone towers are transmitting 5G, the entire 5G cell network is nowhere near from being rolled out. So what it probably is, is my guess, is it's a hybrid mixture of 1, 2, 3, 4G, and then 5G mixed together. And their goal is to replace all the links, so to speak, and turn them into 5G. But 5G operates on an electromagnetic frequency range, which is very punitive and debilitating to your biological immune system. In other words, it's an electromagnetic frequency that is adversarial to you as a human being. You say, well, Paul, how can you possibly say that? Because I read, I think. I've seen the videos, maybe you have, and of, of uh, the U.S. military testing their directed energy beam weapons. It's a big square. They aim it at a crowd. The crowd begins to disperse like their bodies were set on fire in a couple of seconds and people run for their lives. It's because they're aiming an invisible directed energy beam weapon at a crowd for the purpose of, of non-lethal crowd control. And they say it feels like you've been thrown into a boiling vat of flames. It hurts like crazy. But if you run out of the way of the signal, it stops. So it's considered non-lethal crowd control. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out if you turn up the dial of the power of the directed energy beam weapon just a little bit, it goes from lethal to, excuse me, it goes from non-lethal to lethal. In other, in other words, just turn it up a little bit and it'll kill people. Well, why is it that the frequency range of the lethal and non-lethal weapons in directed energy beam weapons is the same frequency range of 5G. That should tell you a lot. And if you don't understand that, get my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, along with Conquering the Matrix and Mass Awakening, because you are living, living in a world where you're living through right now a sophisticated virtual reality event. 
Make no mistake about it. You're living right now in a sophisticated virtual reality event. That does not mean that the coronavirus is not real. It is real. It does not mean that people don't get sick and die from it. It does not mean that it's not contagious. It is. But it's bigger than that. It's a, it's a synergistic relationship between 5G technologies. And if it's not biological warfare, the very fact that it had to do with what they call the bat lady, a scientist that worked at a Wuhan, and all they do is they're, they're fancy with the names, they're fancy footwork with the names. So they, I forgot what exactly what they call the Wuhan Research Facility. Maybe it's the Wuhan Research Facility. Level four, that's the, the, the level of, of a biological plague research facility in terms of supposedly its protocols, its health protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So they go out of their way to say this is not a biological warfare disease. Well, obviously they would say that. You could start war, World War uh, III by saying that too loudly. You could, you could give impetus to all the people who died early and whose lives and livelihoods were destroyed by uh, the coronavirus coming from China and the Wuhan area into the United States. They want to, the, the victims, the people who died and their families who lost their jobs and stuff, they want to engage in a collective lawsuit against the Communist Chinese Party of, of, of China to get, uh, you know, money for their lost relatives and lost businesses and stuff. If, if somebody says, well, that was a biological warfare weapon, you moved it from lawsuit to World War III. So there are geopolitical consequences to all this terminology and stuff. But let's not forget, these facilities exist all over the world, including the United States. And every major superpower or every major military, military nation has an arsenal of biological warfare, of chemical warfare, and laboratories, and they've experimented with it. Most have used it. And they have their own secret antidotes to it, et cetera, et cetera. So can I say whether it's a biological warfare weapon or not with all certainty? No. So I don't say it. That's part of uh, maintaining your credibility is, is, is to not say things that are not true. But, the, but, the, but a serious question mark arises because of how fast and unnaturally it transmits from person to person. And that's why, again, knowledge is power. Okay? Knowledge is power. And you don't pretend it doesn't exist. It's the same, but on the same hand, you don't allow America to be shut down. You don't allow people who have a hidden agenda, a hidden political agenda, to shut America down, to keep people from going back to work, to, to lose their employment, to lose their jobs, to lose the businesses they built, to lose all their financial assets. You don't, you don't destroy people like that. So the multidimensional battle that all believers face is we have to claim back our nation through intercessory prayer. We have to cry out to God in repentance that he would supernaturally intervene in America and that he would restore America. So you remember what we read in, in the book of Revelation? That who knows if the Lord will turn and relent. You don't know what the Lord's going to do if you repent. So quit presuming you do. Go before the Lord and as an intercessor, repent for the church, repent for yourself, and repent for our nation. And let's pray that God supernaturally intervenes. And this spirit behind this coronavirus, one being a spirit of fear, is driven from the land. There are people, and now I talk all about these people, by the way, and the organizations and the groups and what their master plan is. Order out of chaos. They have a very dark agenda, and they're, they're attempting to use this to fulfill their dark agenda. You need to. It is no longer acceptable for a person to call themselves a Christian and be an unequivocal idiot. It really is no longer acceptable. I am so tired of talking to people who's, who tell me they're a Christian, and I don't see the fruits of the Spirit. I see 
proof of being an idiot because they don't know anything about anything. And that's inexcusable. My people will perish for lack of knowledge or vision. You've got to educate yourself. You've got to read multiple sources. You've got to get up to speed for crying out loud. It's like it's like God has called you to play in the Super Bowl or God has called you to play in the Olympics and you didn't show up for half the you know training and dieting and exercising and everything else that goes with it. Well, you're not going to be victorious like that. You can be victorious the day you you decide to win. And in order for you to decide to win, you have to take winning out of your theological grid. I meet many Christians who actually have developed a theology that precludes them from embracing in their consciousness, mind, and heart the word winning and victory. Their theology actually precludes them from being victorious, winning, and being an overcomer. Now, that is a sad state of affairs when if you read the Bible, God tells us over and over again that if we trust him, we walk with him, we obey him and put our faith in him, we will be overcomers. This is the message that we need to send out to Paradise Mountain Church and Paul McGuire Ministries. This is the message that God's people in America and across the world need to resonate with. This is the message that will bring revival and hope and evangelism and making disciples of all nations. But we spread it together. Okay? God bless you. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And remember, Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon.